Oi, I'm sure you clicked on this video because, like me, you have no choice but to use V-Ray for Maya for Agves instead of the industry standard 3DS Max. You may have scoured YouTube for a comprehensive guide to V-Ray for Maya and found nothing but 3DS Max and SketchUp tutorials. You may have stumbled upon an obscure channel with many videos on V-Ray for Maya, but they mostly speak Spanish. If you do speak Spanish, good for you. But what if you are an English speaker? Well, that's where I come in. This video is but the first in a series of videos that will teach you very easily how to create photorealistic renders in Maya with V-Ray. Welcome to the beginner's guide to V-Ray for Maya. In this video, we will look at the basic steps you need to follow before you start working with Maya. 1. Recommended settings. 2. The interface. 3. Navigation. And finally 4. Setting a project. First, let's edit our save options. Head to File and move your cursor to the Save Scene option. You will see a small checkbox by Save Scene. Notice that Maya normally has these checkboxes by her menu options. When clicked, these checkboxes open up pop-up menus that lead to additional settings. So let's go ahead and click on the checkbox beside the Save As option. This gives us instant access to additional save settings. You'll want to turn on incremental saves. What this does is that it creates a backup of your file every time you hit save. You may have seen this before if you use Revit because it is enabled by default in Revit. You could have a file named house.rvt and Revit creates various versions of the file each time you save. So you will have, for example, house.0001, house.0002 and so on. The same thing applies to Maya. This is a very important step because Maya crashes a lot especially during rendering sessions. So you'll want to keep this on in case Maya crashes during a save. I've actually had this happen to me before and my save file got corrupted. So I lost about a week's worth of work. You do not want that to happen to you. Trust me. Incremental saves also help when you've made a mistake on your main file and for some reason undo doesn't work. Then you can go back to the old backup and work from there. You can decide to limit the autosaves. I do this to save memory and because I don't fancy manually deleting house point 1000 from my computer. The second thing we want to do is load V-Ray into Maya. I am assuming at this point you've already installed and activated V-Ray for Maya, so I'm not going to get into that. Go to the window tab and hover over settings and preferences. Then move to plugin manager and click it. As the name suggests, this is where you will load and unload all installed Maya plugins, including V-Ray. Let's scroll over to the V-Ray section and load up V-Ray. You'll want to enable auto-load, so you won't have to repeat this process every time you start up Maya. If you ever run into a problem with one of the other plugins, say for some reason you can't import FBX files without Maya crashing, you'll first want to come and check in the plugin manager if the associated plugins are loaded, before you start troubleshooting. Now, let's edit our preferences. Go to the Window tab, scroll down to Settings and Preferences again, and this time click Preferences. We see a lot of settings that we can adjust in the pop-up menu, but because we are mostly concerned with ArcVis, we're probably not going to use about 90% of this. In the Settings tab, we can edit the units of our projects. Here you can match your project units to the units of the imported file. You can also change the frame rate if you are doing an animated walkthrough. Unless it's an extremely short video with a small amount of assets, I personally do not recommend using Maya for architectural walkthroughs unless you have like a render farm at hand and if you do, go ahead and use it. I'm not stopping you. But my reasoning is that V-Ray for Maya animations take a long time to render. So you are better off using Unreal Engine as it has real-time ray tracing or you could wait until Epic Games beefs up Twin Motion and use that instead. Now scroll down and look for undo. You want to set the undo queue to infinite. The default is actually 50 undos and you may think that's a pretty big number but you'll be surprised by how quickly you blew through the 50. Just to be safe, make it infinite and save yourself some trouble. Next, scroll up to File and Project and enable Autosave. 
I like to enable prompts before autosave because during renders, Maya actually freezes and saves the file before the rendering continues. Maya has crashed during this process a couple of times when I dealt with huge files that took long to save. With this enabled, I only save when I'm doing actual work. You can decide to do whatever you want though. You can set your preferred autosave interval. I like to set it at 15 minutes. Mostly, this depends on how much work you can get done in that time that is not worth losing. Just like with the incremental save, you are allowed to limit your autosaves. I don't limit mine, but frankly, it's up to you. You'll want to keep this on, especially when you have a lot of texture files which you undoubtedly will, so you won't have to keep reloading them into the project. Finally, head over to the rendering tab and set V-Ray as your default renderer so you won't have to switch from Maya software every time you boot up Maya. This here is your viewport, where all of your work takes place. Each viewport is assigned to a particular camera. Up here, you can find the different shelves for different jobs in Maya. You have your noobs and polygon shapes occupying the first two shelves. I normally use the poly shapes as they have subdivisions that you can tweak. We even use the sculpting, rigging and animation shelves in this course, so you can go ahead and learn more about them on your own if you want. Under the rendering tab, you have the default Maya rendering assets like your lights, your cameras and your Maya materials. I normally don't use any of that because I use V-Ray assets instead, but I kind of like Maya's directional lights so I sometimes use them in place of the V-Ray sun. The Bifrost tab gives you access to tools that you can use to create fluid effects like running water or smoke. Marsh is a procedural particle generator. You can use it to simulate rain or create grass. I don't really use Marsh that much because frankly I don't know how to use it. XGen is an instancing software. It can be used to create large fields of grass or an entire forest without worrying about burning up your machine. The instances are like copies, but they don't carry all the information of the original, so they are not as heavy. Think of the instances as kagibunjins. Finally, we come to the shelf we'll most likely be using 90% of the time, the V-Ray shelf. Here we have all our V-Ray rendering assets like lights, materials, fair, volume grids and so on. We'll become well acquainted with this shelf by the end of this course. Let's move on to our workspace. Head over to the poly modeling shelf and create a cube so we can better understand how the workspace behaves. On the bottom left corner, you'll see the axes Maya works in and their corresponding colors and directions. Maya is a 3D software, so it has three axes, X, Y, and Z. These may seem familiar to you if you are coming from SketchUp. The X and Z axes deal with movement on the ground plane, while the Y axis deals with height movements. On the right hand side is the channel box. If I select the cube, you see that the channel box displays the different properties of the cube, including its position in relation to the origin. Editing any of the values in the channel box directly affects the cube. Let's go ahead and test this by inputting 2 into each of the translation values, and we see the cube move as a result. The channel box also allows you to edit objects of the same type all at once. Let's duplicate the cube by selecting it and holding down Ctrl D on the keyboard. Translate the duplicate by 2 on the Y axis. Click and drag to select both cubes and rotate by 30 on the Z axis and we see that both cubes rotate at the same time. This is great for when you have tons of objects like light in a scene and you don't want to waste time individually changing their intensities. Clicking the third icon on the top right corner gives you access to the attribute editor, which in turn gives you access to more properties than the channel box. Here you get access to shape, mesh, material information and so much more. Maya is a node based software, so each asset you create has nodes that connect it to a different asset. The attribute editor is a quick way to navigate between those nodes without opening the graph editor. Our cube, for instance, is connected to the Lambert shader node, which is just a fancy way of saying it has Lambert 1 material applied. Shader nodes become more and more complex as you add more details to your materials, but we'll go more into that in the next lesson. On the right hand side of our viewport, we have our toolbox. This contains our selection and navigation tools, 
And right below that, we have the panel editors and the outliner. The lowest icon is the outliner. This opens up a list of all the objects in your file and is very good for organization. Already, we can see that both cubes are listed here, as well as all our cameras. If we were to create a V-Ray sphere light from the V-Ray shelf, we'll see that the created light pops up in the outliner. We can dock the outliner to the right hand side of the viewport so that we can access it anytime we need it. Above the outliner icon, we have the viewport panel editors. By default, Maya has a single panel configuration. You can switch between single panel, four panels and two panels by clicking on these icons. You can also press the space bar to switch between them. Say we have our single panel option enabled. Hitting the space bar will send us to the four panel screen. Then we can click on any of the windows and hit space bar again to zoom into that window. You can also change the display camera of the panel by heading to panels and selecting a preferred view. This layout is very good for when, let's say you want to edit something in a plan, but you also want to see how it affects the perspective at the same time. Beneath the viewports, we have the time slider and the rain slider, which are normally used for animation. And below that is the command line, where you can input your code. You can switch between the ML and Python languages if you click here. And if you click the icon beside the command line, you open up the script editor, where you can view a history of all the commands you have issued. Let's move on to navigation with a mouse. Using the scroll wheel allows you to zoom in and out. Holding down Alt and right clicking allows for more precise zooming. Alt and left clicking allows you to orbit. Alt and the middle mouse button allows you to pan. If you would like to zoom to or orbit around a specific object, you will need to select the object and press F on the keyboard to focus on said object. This sets the object as the focal point of your camera. Let's head back to the toolbox. The first tool is the selection tool, activated by the keyboard shortcut Q. As the name implies, this tool is used to select objects in Maya. The next two tools are also selection tools. The lasso tool works like the lasso tool in Photoshop, where you just draw around what you want to select. And the paint select selects objects by painting on them. I rarely use those two. The third tool is the move tool, keyboard shortcut is W. Clicking an object with the move tool selected brings up manipulators which correspond to the three axes. The red manipulator moves the object along the X axis, the blue along the Z axis and the green manipulator along the Y axis. Notice that every movement registers in the channel box. You can use the middle manipulator to move the objects without constraints, but I do not really recommend this because it's hard to judge depth in 3D space unless you have a reference point. The square manipulators constrain movements to a particular plane, so you can mess around with that if you want. The scale tool, activated by the shortcut R, works in pretty much the same way, except that this time, using the middle manipulator scales the objects uniformly, which I do recommend. The rotate tool, activated by the shortcut E, when selected, creates spherical manipulators around the object. The manipulators are color-coded to match the three axes. You can click anywhere in the sphere and drag for unconstrained rotations, but the other manipulators work the same as the move and the scale manipulators. We see that we are able to use shortcuts for most basic commands, but what do you do when you want to change those shortcuts or assign shortcuts to other commands? Well, you do so in the hotkey editor. Click on the window tab, scroll to settings and preferences, and click on the hotkey editor right below preferences. Here, you can map any command to any key on the keyboard, provided the key hasn't been mapped already. Let's give it a try. Choose menu items as a category. Go to file and new scene options. Type in any key that hasn't already been mapped, the grayed out keys. I'm going to pick 8 because it's a nice number. Now when I minimize this window and hit 8, the new scene options dialog box shows up.
You can click the X button to reset your entry. Before you save a file in Maya, it's recommended that you set a project. Setting a project allows you to organize all files associated with that project in one folder. Take a look at my project Steelcraft. Maya automatically creates all these folders within my Steelcraft projects folder. So you have a folder for your auto saves, your incremental saves, textures and a render images folder. Maya will save all these files to your projects folder so you don't have to go back and organize them yourself. Also, if you are sharing your work with another person, you can just send the whole project to them and not now be scouring your PC to figure out where you saved render image 9. Let's go ahead and set a project. Click on file and navigate to set project. Next, browse to your preferred location. I already have a Maya folder, so I'll just go there and create a new folder in there called YouTube Tutorials. Next, hit set project. Click create default workspace and your project is set. That brings us to the end of this tutorial. Thanks for watching and if you have enjoyed watching, please hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Also, a little disclaimer. I mentioned before that there aren't a lot of V-Ray for Maya tutorials on YouTube. So most of what I learned about Maya, I learned from watching Max tutorials and Spanish Maya tutorials. I do, I do not speak Spanish. Also, there was a lot of trial and error in my learning process. So if I have said anything that is incorrect in this tutorial, please let me know in the comments so that I too can learn. Thank you again and see you soon, hopefully.